so we're going to look at the second, the second temple, building the second temple today, guys. And we're really just going to fly through quite a bit of material because uh, the second temple gets built uh, by Zerubbabel in Ezra chapters 1 through 6. But I really want us to see what happens uh, a little bit later when the prophets come. After that, Ezra will go down and Ezra will be the prophet to Jerusalem once the temple is built. And then after Ezra, Nehemiah will come down and uh, Nehemiah is going to build the wall around Jerusalem. And it will really be interesting if we can get to this in one swoop and uh, get to this idea of building a wall around Jerusalem. And we'll see what the scripture has to say, because I think it really sets us up for the next era, uh, Jesus coming. And I hope we can see all that together. So uh, let's just imagine the Jews were all down in Babylon. They were in captivity and exile. They had been there for at least 50 years. They're there a total of 70, but some of the exiles come back after 50 years. And that's going to start with Ezra. So let's just imagine what they were expecting. Uh, they had Jeremiah preaching to them. <clears throat> they had uh, Daniel. They had Ezekiel. All these people preaching to them. And what they are... <coughs> <coughs> What they're expecting, yeah, is that mine, Mama? It's mine, but okay. I haven't touched it yet. Keep in mind what they're expecting. A, they're expecting a Messiah that's going to come make everything better. B, they're expecting a brand new temple that if you remember the prophecies, the brand new temple is supposed to far outweigh the glory of the previous temple. And um, there was also the prophetic utterances that all of the nations will be brought into Jerusalem and they'll all want to worship God. They'll all want to grab hold of the coats of the Jews and there'll be this huge influx of all the nations. So we've got this massive, grandiose picture. That's what they would be expecting. But what I'd like us to see if we can get through the whole thing is the constant disappointment with everything. There's always a tiny bit of a climax and then a huge downfall throughout the whole thing. So uh, our story is going to involve three people, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Um, Ezra is the one that writes the account of uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. What's kind of interesting to know is that um, Ezra and Nehemiah used to be one book back in that day. Ezra wrote them both. It was one book. For some reason, we broke them into two different books, but they're one long narrative. <clears throat> Persia is going to be the time frame that we're in because Babylon gets overthrown, so Persia and all the Persian kings. And let's look at the first part. Cyrus is going to release Zerubbabel, uh, and Zerubbabel is going to come back to Jerusalem to build the temple. And with Zerubbabel comes the first wave of Jews. We're going to see three waves of Jews. The first wave goes, um, you can start out in Ezra chapter 1, and we'll just kind of skim through uh, a few of these verses. <clears throat> so if we just kind of skip through, skim through Ezra verse 1, we get a, a, a time frame of 538 B.C. Right there at uh, Ezra 1 verse 1, you could type or you could write 538 B.C., the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Kind of neat here is Jeremiah, or I don't remember if it was Jeremiah, but one of the prophets had already said that uh, uh, Cyrus would be God's anointed. I think it was Jeremiah. So now we see the Lord is stirring up the spirit of uh, the king of Persia. And uh, he went and made a proclamation throughout the kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house. That's going to be verse 2. Ezra 1 and verse 2. Uh, in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, whoever is amongst you of all the people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. <clears throat> he, 
He also sent them back. There's a whole list in chapter 1, a whole list of things that the Babylonians stole from out of the temple. And uh, it looks like Cyrus allowed them to take a lot of those things back to the temple. The word Zerubbabel, the guy's name means planted in Babylon. So it's assumed that Zerubbabel was born over there in Babylon during captivity. And he brings back a lot of people that were probably born in captivity that weren't even uh, familiar with the old way back in Jerusalem. Cyrus lets the Jews return. And then the first thing that the Jews do, uh, they are afraid of all of the people that are surrounding Jerusalem. They're afraid of their neighbors. So if you want to turn over to chapter 3, and we'll just kind of skim through a little bit of this. Because of their fear, the first thing they want to do is start offering sacrifices to God to get in His good graces. So if we pick up chapter 3 and verse 1, when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in the towns and the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. And then uh, arose Jeshua, the son of Zot, Jozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his kinmen, and they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings as it was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land and they offered burnt offerings on it uh, to the Lord. Now, right away, just imagine <clears throat> they've been waiting to be able to come back to Jerusalem. They've been waiting for all these promises, all this glorious uh, messianic kingdom that's going to be a light to the world, that's going to draw all the nations. And no sooner do they get back into Israel that they're afraid of all the people and so the first thing they do is kind of put together this makeshift altar to start offering sacrifices. That's just kind of one of those little notes that I make about the human emotion. Edward! The human, the human emotion that is involved in faith. Faith is like, awesome, God's going to, this is going to be so great, everything's going to work. And then you get there and you're like, whoa, nothing's done, nothing's organized, and we're afraid of all the people. It just always is interesting to me that... Uh, Faith has got to have a stoicism, a resilience in us. So they go on to make the altar, and then they finally get the foundation laid. The foundation for the temple is also in chapter 3. We'll look at verse 10, and look at for some more, some more disappointment as we read this account. Verse 10, uh, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests and their vestments came with trumpets and so on and so forth, to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. We jump down to verse 12. But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice. When they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted for joy, we kind of assume that it was the young ones that were born in Babylonian captivity that had no idea what the temple, Solomon's temple looked like. And then you've got the elder men that have got to be 50 years older now than they were when they went into exile. So those men uh, are brought to tears. Verse 13, so you've got this mixture of people wailing and people shouting for joy. Verse 13 so the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people weeping. The people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from very far away. <clears throat> so off to a really rocky start. Let's look at chapter 4. Here's another anti-climax. Uh, let's just read it. Chapter 4, if we start in verse 1. Uh, keep in mind, I, th I think he's going to mention the people that were already there. Uh, when Jerusalem was sacked, Babylon came and took, I don't remember how many waves of people, but they usually took the top, you know, the most important, vi vital people that would be a blessing to Babylon. Everybody else was left behind in Jerusalem. 
And a lot of times what they would do is bring in strangers to the land that they had conquered so that strangers would mix with the original inhabitants and create this mixed breed of people. So these people that are there in Jerusalem are their old relatives at some point. So let's look at verse 1. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building the temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, because we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the day of somebody, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. Verse 3, but Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. We alone will build the house to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So that seems awfully strange. We'll pause right there. <clears throat> These people come say, let us come build with you. Maybe past relatives, maybe a mixture of other people. And let's keep in mind that one of the things that the prophets had always been announcing is that at some point, Israel is going to be a light to all the Gentiles. All the nations are going to be blessed through Abraham's seed. And so there's this constant expectation that someday all the nations will work their way in with the Jewish people, the Israelites. But notice, you get nothing but resistance from the actual Jews themselves. Leave, you're not part of us, we don't want anything to do with you. And even to this very day, guys, to this very day, the Jews have no interest whatsoever in evangelizing or converting uh, people outside of Jerusalem, uh, Judaism. Uh, matter of fact, they still uh, are praying to God. I told you that uh, somebody I know went to one of their synagogues, one of their services, and in the song, it said, Lord, please do away with the infidels, the Gentiles, something about get them away from us, so on and so forth. So how in the world would, would God's plan of bringing all the nations in to Jerusalem ever happen if it wouldn't have been for Christ? So verse 4, Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and they bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. Just a little side note, guys. It gets, I would need to do a lot more research. It gets very complicated to follow the names because there's Darius the first, Darius the second, Darius the third, Darius the fourth. There's Xerxes. There's Artaxerxes, and then there's Numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. There is um, Cyrus 1, 2, and 3. So the names blend and mix into each other. So you can just understand that there are several kings of Persia between Cyrus and Darius. There are several kings. So these people stopped. Uh, the people that wanted to be useful have now turned into their enemies, and they stopped them from building the temple. Again, here's another one of those things. What is going on? We, we paid our 50 years atonement in Babylon, and now God is supposed to command Cyrus to let us go back to Jerusalem and build this wonderful temple. We should be coming into this glorious, wonderful time, and it's nothing but headaches for the Israelites. So they stopped them from building for several kings. I don't remember exactly how long it was. 70 years total, but after 50 years, it's strange. After 50 years, Zerubbabel already was coming back with one wave of exiles. And the scripture says that that was in the third or fourth year of Cyrus. But it also says Daniel in the first year of Cyrus was in, in, uh, in Babylon, so on and so forth. So Zerubbabel was coming back while Daniel was still stuck down there. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it. It says he slept with his fathers, but God gave him the vision of the future conquering. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so they're discouraged. They're afraid. They're frustrated. Officials are being bribed to lie about Israel. 
And here's an interesting little aspect. If, we, if we're in chapter 4, right around verse 11, we're going to see that they wrote a letter to one of the intermediate kings. His name was Artaxerxes, but there are several Artaxerxeses, so it's hard to know which one we're talking about. But anyway, here's the letter that the neighboring people wrote to Artaxerxes. <clears throat> chapter 4 and verse 11 Artaxerxes or Taxerxes? I think it's in, in the movie 300, they call him Artaxerxes. This is a copy of the letter that they sent to Artaxerxes the king. Your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send a greeting. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and if the walls are finished, they will not pay tributes. They will not pay customs or tolls and the royal revenue will be impaired. I just had to take note of that because what, what do we call that? Uh, pro pro propaganda? Yeah. Propaganda. So it's nothing new. Fake what? News. Fake news. There you go. <laughs> Fake news. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring it into our current situation. But uh, verse 14. Now, because we eat the salt of the palace and it's not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, we're doing this for your sake, king. We don't want anybody to take advantage of you. Uh, therefore, we send and inform the king. Verse 15. In order that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, you will find in the book of the records and learn that this city is a rebellious city. It is hurtful to kings and provinces and that sedition was stirred up in it from old. That is why the city was laid waste. It's amazing. Incredible. Lies were spread, propaganda. And again, this is supposed to be the Jewish heyday. Uh, their past is being used against them. They were bad people back then. They must still be bad people now. So let's get the king on our side to stop these people. Verse 21. Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to cease and that the city may not be rebuilt until a decree is made by me. Take care not to slacken this matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? Verse 23. Then when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshimai, the, the scribe and their associates, they went to haste to the Jews at Jerusalem and by force and power made them cease. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. <clears throat> construction was halted. I don't know if you'd like to make a note there, but uh, right there that construction ceased. You could put 536 B.C. if you're interested in that kind of thing. 536 B.C., construction was halted on the temple. Um, this is just some shoddy background work, but one of the commentaries said that it was about 16 years until Haggai the prophet shows up, and Haggai the prophet will be trying to encourage them to get busy and to get back to building that temple. So let, let's just take a pause and let's go back over to Haggai. Uh, Haggai chapter 1, and we can just take a quick look at some of this. <clears throat> Haggai the prophet, and he is sent to encourage uh, Israel. Now, again, I take a little pause from this. Uh, I, I just can't help but think that the Jewish people thought on their way back to Jerusalem that this was going to be their heyday. And as you can see, it's anything but their heyday. So... Uh, I don't know what you want to do with that, but there's this aspect that sometimes God says something is going to be a certain way. 
but then when we look at how things actually played out, they don't end up that certain way. Uh, there's just some interest there if it had to do with the obedience or disobedience of the people. I don't know. Okay, so Haggai, Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, first day, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, so on and so forth. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to build the house of the Lord. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. It is time. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, verse 6. You have sown much, but you have harvested very little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you don't have your fill. You clothe yourself, but you're never warm. He who earns a wage does so to put them in a bag with holes in it. Then Zerubbabel, uh, verse 12. Yeah, just a pause right there. So there's something that we could take away from that. He says, basically, if you're not living to please me, if you're not living righteously and well, then uh, all that you accumulate will never be enough, so to speak. Uh, I remember when I worked for Icon Office Solutions in Eugene, probably one of the best paying jobs I ever had, and I was broke living paycheck to paycheck. When I got into music, I was making the least amount of money that I had ever made, and I felt like I lived like a king. I loved life, and I did everything I wanted to do, and life was great and I didn't even make half what I was making at Icon. So there's something interesting about this. Uh, the, 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 numbers, the numbers don't add up sometimes. You can make twice as much money and feel more broke. So that's where they were at. Verse, kind of a parallel between verse 4 and what David said back in October. Or oh, yeah. I, I, David said, I can't live in a paneled house while my Lord doesn't have a house. Yeah, there you go. Good. Verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, Joshua, so on and so forth, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, the words of Haggai the prophet. Um, he said, verse 13, Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. Boy, they needed to hear that right about now, don't they? Because you wouldn't think they did. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, the spirit of the remnant of the people. They came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, the sixth month in the second year of Darius. So now they're back at work. I like taking note, guys, uh, something interesting. It, the... This is, I think, the second time we've already heard this, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of somebody. Uh, I think the first one was Cyrus, um, but here it's Zerubbabel. Uh, something powerful in that about me. Uh, you know, for me, either it's prayer or intercessory prayer, but um, there can be people that feel like they have their hands tied, unmotivated, not getting anything done. And then the Lord can come along and stir their heart, and boom, they launch into action. Uh, something pretty neat about that. Even if we apply it to enemies, so to speak, uh, even a bad boss, whatever it is, it never has to feel, to me, a situation never has to feel hopeless, because even if someone is against me, uh, the Lord could stir their heart to be compassionate and nice if He wanted to. So there's never the feeling of desperation. Okay, um, let's move on. Let's go back to Ezra. We just broke off to listen to that prophecy. They're going to go back and they're going to start in the second year of Darius. They're going to start working on the temple again. We're back in Ezra and we'll be in chapter 6. And chapter 6, we're going to finish Zerubbabel and we're going to finish the building of the temple. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 6, and we'll look at verse 14. 
And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished the building by the decree of God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. This house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, the sixth year of the reign of Darius. So it looks like it took four more years uh, for them to finish the temple. And it's done. Uh, you know, we sort of watched the decline of the dwelling place of God. There was the sanctuary and nothing compared to that because it was Moses and God, Moses and God, chapter after chapter after chapter. God commanded this. Moses did it just the way God planned. Uh, I thought we noticed when we got into Solomon and David, the, 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 the narrative of the building kind of gotten trailed off and took a different form. And now we've got the third and final narrative of the building of the second house and really where the other two narratives devoted several chapters to the building of the house. Uh, if you go back, the, the house gets mentioned, but stuff isn't getting done. So you've got like a handful of verses of them actually building this thing. So it just seems like there was this interesting little progression of less important, less important, less important. They finished the temple, and then uh, chapter 6, verse 14. Oh, wait, we did that, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, add insult to injury, nobody was impressed with the new temple. Um, oh, I'm sorry, guys. i got to take you back to Haggai. Haggai is going gonna, is gonna to try to comfort them. Back to Haggai uh, chapter 2. Haggai, is, not only did he uh, encourage them to get back to work on the house, but now when everyone is disappointed with the house because it pales in comparison to the former house, Haggai is going to tell them some things that we'll want to make note of for the future. The temple is built, it's lackluster. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 2. Now speak to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? That's... Something <laughs> right, not impressive. Where's the heyday? Where's the what do we call that? The uh, the great uh, when a nation has this great revival. I guess a revival. I don't know, but just I'm just surprised at how uh, uh, what's the word? A tragedy? I don't know. All right. So verse four. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the Lord. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you first came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. So the temple isn't impressive. You've got enemies all over everywhere. There's crying and moaning. There's been apathy. But I am amongst you. I am still with you. There's a, there, there seems like a, that's, that that's a big... Uh, uh, what do we call that? That's a big... Uh, everything's going terrible, but God says, but I am I'm there with you. So It's an encouragement. It's also, I want to say anticlimactic. What's the word? Uh, Anyway, I guess I don't have it there. Uh, so fear not, I am in your midst. Uh, thus said the Lord of hosts, one more time in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I'd put a little square around that. I want to come back to that. The heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, declares the Lord. In this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. A lot going on there. Uh, for, 
For the 70 years in Babylon, they've been looking forward to this moment in time. And yet now that they're in this moment in time, God says, no, 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 no. This is not the good moment in time. The glory is going to come later in the future, guys. Sorry to disappoint you. It's going to be later down the road. When he says, I will shake the heavens and the earth, we touched on that in the past, guys. And that, we, we want to embrace that that is an idea. What the heavens and the earth, he is referring to these two things. A lot of times the Bible will refer to, I don't know if it calls them constellations. Uh, the sun and the moon. Okay, when you try to imagine these people in that limited mindset, uh, this is roughly 500 years before Christ. All of these are the idea of something permanent. Okay? Anytime you go out in your backyard, and you, what, are we, what is this thing? There you go. Anytime you go out in your backyard, anytime you go camping, whatever, there's a comfort when you look in the sky because you know you're going to see something. There's this idea of this permanent thing. It's always going to be there. The moon is always going to be there. The sun is always going to come up. These stars, the, when the Bible uses language like this, it's for the purpose of suggesting something permanent. And then God says, I'm going to shake these, or I'm going to destroy these, or I'm going to make them brand new. A brand new heaven and a brand new earth. All of that language is the idea of taking away something that you've been very, very familiar with, right? Something that you think is a constant in your life. I'm going to shake it up. I'm going to take it up. I'm going to take it away, and I'm going to make something brand new. So it's kind of good to have a little grasp on these things. The idea is that these are the image of permanence, and God says, I'm going to shake them. I'm going to, and, and that's a, a historical way of saying something brand new is going to happen, and something that you're used to is going to go away. <clears throat> uh, when he says that the, the fill the house, and I will fill the house with, glory. So another little note on that, uh, something that never happens in the second temple that happened in both the tabernacle and Solomon's temple. You guys remember what it is? In the tabernacle, God's glory did what? Came into, it was the climax of the temple. In Solomon's first temple, we saw the exact same thing, right? Now that we're at the second temple period, uh, God never comes back in. And in addition to that, first of all, it's embarrassing. It doesn't look anything like the old one. God never comes back, and the uh, Ark of the Covenant never returns. So this thing is pretty empty. There's not much here. But God says, instead of me coming back and filling that temple like He's done in the past, He says, my spirit will be with you. I am dwelling with you. And then I didn't do a lot of research on this, but guys, but verse 9 it says that the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former glory. Uh, what's the idea of glory? What does he mean by that? In You can just make a side note. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 7 through 8. 1 Corinthians 11, 7 through 8. Uh, this idea of glory is, is something looking different. So in that passage in Corinthians... It goes on to say, well, you guys are turning to it, so I'll, I'll let me go. Okay, so this is it, but this thing is embarrassing to look at, right? And what happens 
is Herod the Great during the time of Jesus will take and uh, he will turn this thing into a gigantic world famous uh, Josephus writes about the courtyard, the, the temple in Jerusalem that we see in images. Well, he's not just one of the wonders of the world, not the religious faith. Absolutely. He built this thing, and Josephus says, if you've never seen the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you have never seen a magnificent building. And then we'll remember when the apostles were walking with Jesus. Jesus, look at what large stones they used in the temple. This thing was a, a picture of awe. And again, like we've kind of been saying ever since the tabernacle, God is never impressed with the buildings. They, when they go, look at how impressive the building is, Jesus' answer is, there's not going to be one stone left on top of another one. Uh, so, <clears throat> God never comes to dwell in this temple, but He says, my spirit will be with you uh, I was going to say about the glory, uh, 1 Corinthians. What is this idea of glory? The glory won't be the same as it was in the past, or the glory will be better. What's this, what's this idea of glory? Um, it has to do with what something looks like. So just to give you an example, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, you see the exact same word being used of the husband and wife. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Oh, there you go. Uh, for man was not made from a woman, but woman was made from a man. Huh? We're going to be 1 Corinthians 11. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's 8. Okay, no, verse 7. A man ought not cover his head because he is the image and the glory of God. But a woman is the glory of man. Man was not made from woman, but woman was made from a man. So this idea of glory is that it's going to look like something. Uh, whatever he's saying there, man was made in the image and glory of God. There's a certain look that a man has, and I would just call it masculinity. And he goes, that's the image and glory of God. A woman has a different look. Her image and glory is the image and glory of the man. So... The man was made to please God. The woman was made to please the man. So this idea of glory, I didn't do a lot of work on that, guys, but when he says the latter glory, the way it's going to look in the future is going to be far greater than the way it ever looked in the past, there's two things he could be doing with that. Either he's going to say, Herod is going to build this thing and it's going to be awesome, or what I think he's saying is it's going to, be something completely different. And we're talking about uh, Jesus uh, as the cornerstone of the, of the... What am I saying here? Uh, the future building, I think the glory is going to be completely different. It's going to be the church. The church is going to be the new temple. So whichever one of those he was meaning, the future glory will far outweigh the old glory. One of those two is what he's talking about. Okay, so that's the building of the temple. Let's take a little look at uh, trying to reestablish the law. Uh, a second wave of Jews is now going to leave Babylon, and we see that beginning with Ezra. Ezra is going to begin in, uh, back in Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Ezra is going to come back because he wants to do spiritual reforms to Israel. The temple is now built. He wants to go back and teach Israel the Torah. And uh, Artaxerxes, another, <laughs> another Artaxerxes, is now king of Persia. Uh, let's see what he says. Um, the second temple is built in 520 B.C. by Zerubbabel. Ezra and the wave of exiles with him returns in 458 B.C. So this is 60 years after the temple is reconstructed. You might write that at the beginning of chapter 7. 60 years after the temple gets rebuilt. 
Ezra's job is to reconstitute the religious life of Israel. So let's pick up his story in chapter 7. <clears throat> Artaxerxes sends Ezra back to Jerusalem along with another wave of Israelites to teach the Torah. So verse chapter 7 and verse 1 now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, Sur the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, so on and so forth, all the way down through verse 5, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest, verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given the king, and he granted him all that he asked. Verse 7. And there went up also to Jerusalem the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests. The situation back in Jerusalem was bad, because the Jews there had now begun to intermarry with all of the neighboring people. So here's another anticlimactic. Uh, Ezra goes back to revive the Torah, revive the spiritual morale of the people. But when he gets there, he finds out the people have all intermarried. They've intermarried with Canaanites, Hizzites, Perizzites, and Egyptians. Ezra finds out about this, and he's really upset. So let's look at chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. And we'll look at verse 3. Ezra 9 and, and, and verse 3. As soon as I heard this, that they had intermarried, I tore my garments and my cloak and I pulled the hair from my head and my beard and I sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, they gathered round me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. Verse 9, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month, twentieth day of the month. All the people sat in the open square, before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have broken faith and married foreign women. Oh, sorry, Mom. Verse 10. I'm in chapter 10 and verse 10. Uh oh. Oh. Sorry. I didn't realize. Okay, chapter 10 and verse. What I just read was chapter 10 and verse 9. So now chapter 10 and verse 10. Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have broken faith and married foreign women, and so increase the guilt of Israel. Now then make a confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do His will. Separate yourself from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, It is so, we must do as you have said. And so now you've got all of Israel divorcing all the women that they had married during their time in Jerusalem. It was a huge, uh, just a dark, a dark spot, but man, could anything, could things get any worse for these people? So they're commanded to divorce all the foreign women that they had married. And that brings us to the end of the uh, reforms of Ezra in his account. We'll finish off with uh, going into the book of Nehemiah. Again, Nehemiah is, was supposed to be part of the book of Ezra, but for some reason our scholars have separated them, but it's one story. He goes on to write, Ezra is still writing Nehemiah, and, he, uh, and uh, Nehemiah is allowed to go back to Jerusalem now, so Nehemiah is going to be the third person that the king lets go back, and Nehemiah's purpose for going back is to build a wall and to make Israel secure. 
So, uh, I had a note here. The events in Nehemiah, I don't know if you want to put this on top of the page there, Nehemiah. The events related to Nehemiah begin in 445 B.C. Nehemiah returns to fortify Jerusalem. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 5. Nehemiah 2 and verse 5. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, so that I may rebuild it. I don't know if you guys remember the story of Nehemiah, but the whole time they're trying to rebuild the walls, they have to have a sword in one hand to fight their enemy, and they're trying to lay bricks with the other hand. Extreme opposition, again, extreme difficulty, and uh, uh, difficult situation. So Nehemiah goes back to build the walls while Nehemiah is uh, building the walls. Zechariah is the prophet that starts trying to give these people hope. So we're going to finish out looking at just a couple verses in Zechariah. If you turn to Zechariah chapter 2. <clears throat> So Zerubbabel went back to build the temple. Ezra went back to do the reforms and preach the Torah. Nehemiah goes back to build the walls. And uh, again, <laughs> I want you to watch... Uh, Nehemiah's whole purpose, Nehemiah's whole goal seems to be counter to what God's goal is. And I'll, I'll show you how this works out in the prophecy. Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 3. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him, and said, Run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. That is a picture of the future. Uh, that's a, a picture of what prophetically, before we began this study, I said we were waiting for a Messiah. We were waiting for a new temple. We were waiting for a new Jerusalem. And we were waiting for... Finally, when all the nations are welcome to come into Jerusalem, and here in Zechariah, we see Zechariah is trying to encourage these people who are not living in the reality that they expected. Zechariah says there is going to be a day when so many people from the nations are coming into this city, Jerusalem, So many people are coming in that what? You won't be able to have what? You can't have walls. It's these types of prophecies, guys, that I think are now looking way beyond physical temples, physical Jerusalem, uh, physical Israel. And it's looking way beyond to a day where he says, when the nations start coming in, there's going to be so many people that you won't be able to put walls around it. And in this sense, I'm kind of starting to blend into this time period where the whole world will be God's dwelling place. It's not going to be a temple anymore. It's not going to be Jerusalem anymore because the number of people involved <laughs> physical locations will not be able to house the sheer number of people that are going to come. So I think it's at this point that we start seeing Jerusalem, the temple, Israel must be taking on a physical, I mean a uh, spiritual, thank you, a spiritual connotation. And I think that when he says the, the glory will far outweigh the glory previous, I think it's talking about this big idea. And that's just a rough sketch, guys, a rough sketch because I blew through the material. Let me give you one other prophecy 
uh, Zechariah. We're still in Zechariah. Let's look at chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 20. Verse 20, Thus said the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Verse 22, Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, in those days, so this is way off in the future, ten men from the nations of every tongue will take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, you, you're, you, in your mind, you're thinking, okay, the Jews are going to have a, a, something big to do with this. Uh, the Jews are going to be leading in Gentiles into this place. But I think there is hyperbole here. I'll just kind of see what you think. I'll share it with you. First of all, he says, uh, people from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue uh, will come, and they'll say, we want to go with you because we've heard that God is with you. Can you guys... Pop quiz, can you give me two times where you've already seen that happen? I want to go with you. Ooh, you got it. Ruth, when Naomi and her sons and her husband had to go to Moab, I think they went to Moab, uh, to escape the famine that was in Bethlehem, they left and then their the boys die, her husband dies, but one of the boys' wife, Ruth, the Moabite, she says to Naomi, I want to go with you. I want your God to be my God, so on and so forth. So there's an example we've already seen. Uh, the Scriptures already show us that Gentiles were already wanting to come worship the same God that the Jewish people worshipped. Okay, what's the second one? Did he did he come around to the? I want to take some of the dirt back to worship on it. Okay. But he said, "Please don't be mad, because I'll have to take the man to the island." Okay. It's my job. Yeah, I don't remember Naaman's story as well, but this one. We heard about how big and terrible your God is. Don't hurt us. Let us help you. Or let us you got it. Yeah, the group that snuck times. in and said, we, we brought stale bread, so you think we're from a long way off. Mm -hmm. We won't make a curse. Rahab specifically said, We've heard about, I've heard about your God. I want to come worship your God. So this, this thing about people grabbing hold of the Jews and, and ten of them, the number 10 was supposed to be a number of, uh, it, was some, it had a significance to it. So it's not literally 10 Gentiles for every Jew. But the idea is, do you remember, what did the woman want? The woman that grabbed a hold of Jesus' coattail? Have mercy on me, forgive me, heal me. That's the idea, grabbing hold of the, of the coat, coattails, whatever that's called. And we've already seen it, and he goes, but in the future, this is going to happen to such a great degree, he says, to such a great degree. Uh, people will all want to come to Jerusalem. Again, uh, trying to wrap our mind around the idea that not so much the literal interpretations, but the heavenly Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, people are going to want to come get involved in that. And that's the expectation that we're left with. I'm glad we made it all the way to Nehemiah. Uh, because the idea was, I'm going to go build walls to keep everybody out. And the whole prophecy was, this movement is going to get so big that you have to give up on walls because you won't be able to contain all the people that are going to come into it. Mm. 
And I thought that was a very neat place to leave off because now <laughs> the people that were waiting for this moment have been told, you got to wait for another moment. And that's going to be Jesus coming and Jesus being the cornerstone of a spiritual temple. And so we'll look at that one next, guys.